Hi, I'm James Dilley, experimental archaeologist and flint napper. For this video, I'm going to be looking at the Salutrian spear, some of which would be considered some of the finest stone tools from the Paleolithic. To give a little bit of background, the Salutrian is a relatively short part of the Upper Paleolithic that occurred in southwestern France and down in the Iberian Peninsula. It lasted from around 25,000 years ago to 19,000 years ago, which, as noted by some researchers, appears to follow the course of the last glacial maximum. The Salutrian was eventually succeeded by the Badagulian and Magdalenian periods. The people of the Salutrian were anatomically modern humans, like us. The last Neanderthals had died out several thousand years prior. It's important to note that it's the techno-complex, which is stone tools among other artefacts, which sets the people of the Salutrian apart from other groups who might otherwise fall into a Gravettian or Epigravettian techno-complex elsewhere in Europe. Like other sub-periods of the Upper Paleolithic, spearhead styles have been used as type fossils to divide the Salutrian into a sequence of phases during the early 20th century. However, that chronology has been challenged more recently by researchers who have pointed to a number of inconsistencies at Salutrian sites in Iberia. The time period, Salutrian, gets its name from the site of Croix du Charnier in Salutre Poyi, often just known as Salutre. Here, hunters preyed upon herds of horses whose skeletal remains were found at the foot of the rock of Salutre from 1866. It was once believed that these hunters drove the herds of horses over the cliff at the top of the Rock of Salutre. However, that wasn't actually suggested by the original excavator of the site, Henri Testo Ferre, but instead an 1872 prehistory themed novel. If we think about the Upper Paleolithic as a time period, we should really be thinking about laminar blade production as the dominant method. The blades would have been worked unifacially, so that means flaked on one side or face. And for a bit of background research, I have actually done another video in the series, so go and check that out. So what is it about these Salutrian stone tools that sets them apart from other Paleolithic groups? The Salutrian is different from most other Upper Paleolithic groups in that they made both unifacial tools on blades and bifacial tools flaked on both sides. I appreciate this doesn't sound like an extraordinary difference until we start to look at those bifacial tools. Some of the finest examples of the Salutrian laurel leaves came from a collection that was found at the site of Volgu in eastern France. Some of the Volgu spears were 25 to 33 centimetres in length and less than a centimetre in thickness. This led to Salutrian points from other sites that had the same style and level of refinement also being classed as Volgu points. The manufacture of the Volgu points had not taken place on site, as no flint napping debitage was found. The raw material was sourced 150 kilometres downstream of the Loire in the southern Paris basin. It is not unusual for Paleolithic people to have carried raw lithic material sometimes hundreds of kilometres away from the source area. Certainly in the case of blade cores, this is to be expected. It is likely that the raw materials were roughed out at source to a lighter preform before being carried elsewhere to be finished. The Salutrian workshop site of Le Maitre in central France yielded 60,000 pieces of flake stone. Here, flint nappers worked on large pieces of good quality local flint. Archaeologists were able to analyse the waste flake scatter to determine the flint was worked down to a preform before the nearly finished spearheads were taken elsewhere.
The raw nodule would have been worked through a primary sequence cortex removal using hard hammer stones. Large flakes are detached at this initial stage to remove surface features and generally begin to set up opportunities for thinning. The rough out would have gone through a secondary phase to thin it down dramatically using hard hammers, abraders and antler soft hammers. The aim was to keep the rough out as long and as wide as possible while flaking invasively across the surface. The globular lumps turn into wobbly lens shapes, then refined lenses before starting to look like thin sheets of stone. From this point, the preform may be taken elsewhere if we were in Le Maitre during the Solutrean. Once we arrive at our next destination and found a moment to finish the preform, it would go through a final thinning and shaping phase. Instead of just soft hammers and abraders, I would also use antler tines to push off flakes from the edge. This is a far more controlled method for flaking thin tools as it reduces the chances of snapping it through percussion. As well as the distinctive laurel leaf or volgu points, smaller spear tips from the Solutrean were made using blades. These were also finely flaked to produce shouldered points, willow leaf points and teardrop shaped points. It has been assumed that these smaller spear points were used on throwing spears alongside the heavier laurel leaf tip spear which were more likely to be thrusting spears. At sites such as Salutre, Hunters preyed upon a variety of mammals, not just horses. Different prey would obviously have different characteristics and therefore require different hunting strategies. Though we will never know the exact details of these strategies, we can look at both the environment and hunting equipment to give us some clues. As mentioned, the site of Solutre is located at the foot of a huge rocky outcrop. This almost certainly offered shelter to those that lived there rather than a takeoff strip for any fleeing horses. It's likely that the rock offered both a lookout point and a possible obstacle to drive prey up to, which could restrict their escape routes. This is not a new tactic and not even one first employed by modern humans. Neanderthals and probably earlier hominids used cliffs and rocky outcrops to limit the movement of their prey. Some sites such as Stelmore, dating to the late Upper Paleolithic, have yielded the exact locations hunters chose to bottleneck fleeing herds of reindeer. A little bit of controversy now to round things off. Solutrean spears have been used as evidence to suggest Europeans crossed into North America thousands of years before the Vikings or Senor Columbus. Now clearly the idea of Europe or Europeans was a long way off, 
but essentially the Solutrean hypothesis suggests that people travelled via sea by navigating along the edge of pack ice which extended from France to North America. The evidence for this theory is based on some similarities between the flaking of Solutrean points and Clovis points which first appeared just over 13 and a half thousand years ago. Supporters of this theory also point to the fact that Solutrean toolkits included needles and that needles can be found in modern Inuit toolkits. Concrete evidence, I'm sure you'll agree. The Solutrean hypothesis has been widely rejected due to the vast amount of archaeological, genetic, oceanic and geographic issues with the theory. Some still believe there's some substance to it, but not many. I guess it's no wonder really that the Solutrean spears that are so iconic, so beautifully made, have received so much attention over the years and some controversy to boot as well.